Happy Friday, Buzz City. As Charlotte prepares for the winter storm ahead, we are preparing for the number one team in the West in the Denver Nuggets. I'm Aaron Pitsenberger for Hornets.com. That is Matt Ruchinski, and this is the HornetsFanshop.com pregame show. Now, before we get into it, we have a game day special to talk about. What and you got? Aaron hit it right on the head, right on time for this monster snowstorm that's coming to Charlotte. What do you need? Clothes to stay warm. What are those? Sweatshirts and jackets right now on HornetsFanshop.com. Get 20% off all sweatshirts and jackets using the code 49FALL. You also get not just the 20% the off, you also get free shipping if you order over $49 worth of stuff. Christmas is coming, the storm's coming, get your stuff now, maybe it'll be here by Sunday. <laughs> Well, now that we're talking about the Hornets fan shop, we have a we have an event coming up next mm -hmm. Thursday, December 13th. The Muggsy and Malik autograph signing at Hornets fan shop right here at Spectrum Center. Make sure you get here. It's from 530 to 630. I know a ton of people who have already RSVP'd on our Facebook page, so make sure you guys get here. And we also have a cool thing that Malik has been doing. Um, if you guys can see this, he has designed this t-shirt that's going to be available at the Hornets fan shop when you guys arrive next Thursday. And you know, we, we were looking at it, we were like, okay, Lepanto, there's a couple other couple other things on here. What do you think of this shirt? I'll tell you what, players are unpredictable. There is no doubt about that. When we came up with this idea wanting to have players design shirts, we told them that they could kind of have free reign as long as we use kind of our look and feel the things, let them pick the color, let them pick the fonts, all those type of things. A little bit different shirt by Malik, but when you watch the video that we're going to show here soon, you're going to understand why he put this in. This is actually a nice personalized shirt that Malik made. And to tie that up with having him signing in the fan shop, being able to get this shirt autographed, something that he designed. If you're a Malik, Malik Monk fan, a Kentucky fan, that's a great shirt to have and a great thing to have to give to somebody maybe for the holidays if you know a <laughs> Kentucky fan out there. Good call. Yeah, no question. This really means a lot to him. Mm -hmm. And our digital designer, Jesse DeBolt, did a great Great job working with Malik and figuring out what he wanted, what was really important to Malik, and what he wanted to kind of express on this t-shirt. So let's take a look at that, t that video. We had this idea about doing like collab with different players and kind of like work with you to design a t-shirt that fans can buy at the fan shop. What color the shirt? Whatever color you want it to be. Black. You know, black shirt. And you're from Arkansas, right? No panto. Maybe doing something with the uh, Hornets kind of word mark. Yeah, E P A E N T O. With that, the Lepanto and the Hornets thing. We can do something with the XO too, though. I need that on there. You want to put the XO on there? Uh, let's see. We can make it black and white. We can make it uh, whatever the hell you want. No, we to need that too. Yeah. We make the outline on the black that's gonna stand out with the white yeah. That Hornets logo like on this side. Nah, that look that looks straight. I like that. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, that look alright. I think that'd be cool. We got us a shirt. You good with it? That look alright, man. Well, Malik is the feature of basketball right there, but let's talk about the flip side of this Hornets fan shop signing and talk about the past with Muggsy Bogues. Muggsy's been an ambassador for us for the since the beginning mm -hmm. of the season. How, is, how has it been working with him? I mean, Muggsy's been absolutely great. When he comes in here, just the energy he brings to a building, he can make anything fun, anything a joke, and it, it just makes things easy to produce with him and get done with him. We've got some great outtakes maybe one day we'll share with y'all from all the Muggsy stuff that went on when he came in here, but it's great to see the organization doing something like this for Muggsy Bogues. He's an icon in the city of Charlotte. When you talk about the Charlotte Hornets, Fans anywhere will bring up Muggsy Bogues first. And I think it's funny because we watched a feature about Muggsy and fans were talking about, hey, he was the smallest guy out there so he could relate to the normal NBA fan. Not everybody's going to be 6'7", 6'8", and have that kind of skill. But he had skill for a guy who was shorter than me. And that's great to see. That's what fans like to see, and that's what really made him beloved here. Oh, no question. You can see kind of the future of basketball now. It's kind of getting to that point. Not to the extreme of, of Muggsy height, but, you know, right. where the, these guards are getting smaller and smaller. And so it's really cool to see that, you know, he kind of, you know, not 
willingly, but you know, he kind right. of like paved the way that he did, way. He did really help change the game a little bit because it wasn't something that was known. It was not something that getting a, any player under six feet tall was <laughs> tough to do. So it was great to see Muggsy do this. Let's see what he's going to do here when he comes out for one of these nights, and it's going to be great on December 14th. Exactly. Well, yes, autograph session on the 13th. 14th, you have got to be here. It's our next classic night, and the first 10,000 people through these doors at Spectrum Center get a Muggsy Bogues bobblehead. I'm really looking forward to this yep. night. I'm looking forward to seeing Muggsy out here. We're going to do some great stuff with him, and we'll see how the fans react. We know it's going to be great here in the Hive. All right, well, we're looking forward to that. Let's take a look at your interview with Muggsy to talk about that night. I'm Matt Rachinski for Hornets.com, now being joined by Hornets legend Muggsy Bogues. Muggsy, on December 14th, this team is going to be celebrating Muggsy Bogues <laughs> Night. Just let that sink in for a minute. What does that mean to you to know that they're going to give a night dedicated just to you? I mean, I'm just thankful. What can I say? I'm thankful and graceful uh, that the Hornets organization decided to, to honor me and my family on a, you know, my time, my tenure here in the Hornets organization. Uh, the community was such a special, you know, have a special place in my heart, especially the fans, and that's what it, you know, that's what's going to make it so special, you know, because I did it with them and the support that I had uh, throughout my time here was on. It was priceless. It was, it was it was breathtaking for me. So, you know, for them to to come to this conclusion to honor me, I mean, I'm just thankful and grateful that I have the opportunity to share this with my friends and family. Not like anybody's going to need anything else to remind them of Muggsy Bogues, but you're going to get one of those giant hive cells. It's going to be put up in the main lobby mm -hmm. next to Dell's, next to Alonzo. What does that mean to you to know that you're going to be represented here as people walk through this building? Uh, it's just going to be again. Uh, a, a graceful, a graceful, uh, a graces, a thankful, a humbling, you know, experience. You know, knowing that you know people get to walk past uh, a platform to see, you know, my history and the things that I was able to, you know, accomplish, and you know, to to look up there one day and say, possibly one day that kid could possibly be, you know, up here on this, uh, on this, this wall, on this, you know, in this, uh, and be honored in this way. So it just, I'm just thankful, man. I'm just thankful that I'm in this position that the Hornets you know decided to recognize me and to give me that day and you know for all the miles that have been put on these little legs that you know to share with the fans and that's what it's all about that's what makes it special. Did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine this is the path your career would take after you were selected in the expansion draft to come to Charlotte? Not in my wildest dream you know you just you know, let life take care of itself, and you, you know, you pretty much uh, just go accordingly. And uh, and after it's all said and done, you look up and see what you was able to, you know, accomplish throughout that time. And you know, thankful for me, I was able to do some good things, you know, and uh, and be recognized for it. So, uh, you know, it's just uh, a moment in history that you feel good that, you know, you was able to accomplish a lot of the things that you've been carrying around in that thought process for so long. I say able to do some good things. I think that's Muggsy, the humble guy, yeah. getting at us. You were able to do some amazing amazing things. Does it still mean something to you when you walk around and you see fans, not just adults, but even their kids now know who Muggsy Bogues is? What does that mean to you to see that reaction in this city? Well, that's the joy. Of, that's the joyful part of it, you know, saying that, you know, you're able now uh, to be looked upon as, you know, someone that they, they really idolize and they really look up to. And, uh, you know, and the parents continue to educate their kids, uh, to give them that history, to let them know, you know, what someone before them was able to accomplish and had the you know was able to overcome a lot of obstacles with folks didn't really you know believe he was able to do so you know in that sense and, and being able to be part of such you know one of the most iconic classic movies that have been made in Space Jam keeps that generation gap going you know in terms of you know that basketball you know part of it so I mean it's just great for me and thankful and I'm honored that uh, you know kids still recognize who I am and the parents are able to you know have share a little of my testimony with them to let them know that anything is possible. Now when everybody comes out on December 14th against the Knicks to see you and see this team play, they're also all going to go home with something. Another Mug Muggsy Bogues bobblehead. You've had a chance to see this new one. What do you think of the new one? Uh, they did a great job with it. I mean, again, they got the, uh, the uniform perfectly fitted. Uh, they got the head, you know, bigger than the body, so that's good. You know, the lips look good. They really uh, did a great job with that in terms of making my soup coolers look the right size uh, but I'm grateful I'm thankful and, and happy that you know they was able to honor me in this for in this fashion you know again I can't believe 
I can't say enough, uh, and I thank for him for the Hornet organization for doing this for me and my family. All right, well, we look forward to seeing you on December 14th, and we look forward to seeing you, our fans as well, on December 14th to celebrate Muggsy Bogues night with us against the New York Knicks. Get your tickets now on Hornets.com. Get out and see this guy. Joining us now is Hornets assistant coach Jay Hernandez. Jay, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, this is the first time that you've been on this show this season. Now, for our fans who aren't necessarily familiar with you, how uh, tell us about your upbringing and uh, how'd you get to, how'd you get to be here? Well, uh, I started with my own basketball training business. I played at uh, Hofstra University under Jay Wright. Uh, I was now Villanova. Uh, played a few seasons overseas, um, uh, well, in Puerto Rico. Yeah, my father played on the national team there, so it gave me the opportunity to go there and play a little bit. Uh, the season ran from April to July, August, so uh, I was able to do some other stuff on the side. And I uh, had a, just a different background. I started in pharmaceutical sales. And I did that for two years. Um, you know, I had a good run there, and I was training on the side. So I started training with guys like Wally Zerbiak, who was a local guy. Uh, worked with Speedy Claxton, who was a teammate of mine in college, and um, really working with a lot of young kids that needed fundamentals. So I just loved the, the process of it. And um, I talked to my wife, Allison, and said, I want to go to Puerto Rico, play one more year. This was after taking some time off and uh, save that money, try to come back and start my own training business. Uh, give ourselves six months to make it happen, otherwise I'll go back to pharmaceutical sales and have the, the car and the gas card and all the things that came with it. Uh, <laughs> but um, I didn't have to look back. You know, I just started training and started a company called Pro Hoops at the time. And uh, 10 years in, um, and I started doing that, and then that's when I got the, the look at the NBA. Now the, the National Players, are, I'm sorry, the National Coaches Association came out with a great piece of content on you yesterday. If you guys haven't t taken a look, we just retweeted it on the Hornets account. So make sure you take a look at that. And in that piece, you mentioned that one of the biggest pieces of importance to you is developing these guys and keeping that relationship with yeah. them. Why is that so important to you to hold that relationship with these players? I think it's important. You keep hearing about player development. A lot of it comes down to the trust that guys have in you to help them get better and that they're getting the right information. And so the relationship is paramount. If, they, if you don't have that there and that, that establishment of trust, then you're not going to get a lot out of them. And uh, so I'm trying to be that bridge between working on their skill level and then helping them from our coaching side. How does that apply to us winning games? And so that's the most important thing, you know, for us as a whole, to try to put it all together. And uh, like I said, over the years with the kids that I started training that are now adults, I still have those relationships with them. You know, we've got people that are doing great things in other fields, and uh, it's been cool to see how they've grown up and matured and how a lot of those lessons have helped them. And it's the same thing for, with our guys. Even though they're in the NBA, a lot of them are coming in very young. And so they need some guidance. They need people that they can lean on uh, that are part of the organization. And that, I think that's the, the best thing I can do for those guys is help them with building that relationship and then being honest with them so that we can get them better. The other thing Jay doesn't realize he's just done is there's probably about 10 to 20 guys out there, men or women, in pharmaceutical sales <laughs> looking at their significant other right now saying, right. I can do something yeah. else. <laughs> this can be done. I can coach in the NBA. This yeah, is going to happen. Right? You mentioned your relationship with Jay Wright at Hofstra to learn underneath him. When you were playing there, obviously every player gets to a point and they realize this is as far as I'm going to get. Yeah. Did, how much of an influence did he have on you saying, I might want to be a coach one day? He had a great influence, and I didn't know that, that influence was there until much later on mm -hmm. in terms of coaching and what I learned from him. Um, you know, it was just more about leadership at the time. Being a captain for the, the, two, the two teams that went to the NCAA tournament there uh, was, was a big deal because he held us accountable and we had a lot of meetings and addressed a lot of issues. And, um, you know, a lot of it was about how we're leading our guys. And uh, he just helped me find my style of leadership. Mm -hmm. And that was important. You know, I said, you're different than Speedy. Speedy graduated and then I became the point guard full time, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, he said, you're just a different player, a different style. And so you have to find what works for you and how you're going to push the buttons for our, our team this year. And uh, so I thought that was the most valuable thing I got from him. And later on, you know, he did offer me a, an opportunity to join him at Villanova. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't thinking about coaching. I just really loved what I was doing. And I just, I told him no at the time. I just didn't have an exit strategy <laughs> with my program. I had six other trainers that were working with me. My wife was a tenured teacher in New York, which is really hard to come by. And, um, you know, he said, like, in a year from now, two years, I think you'll be in the NBA if that's what you want. And I, again, I wasn't thinking about it. I just laughed it off a little bit. Uh, but it did start getting me thinking about how I would exit the business and make sure that my people were still taken care of when mm -hmm. I left and you know give us an opportunity to c continue to grow you know as a family as well and he had that foresight and saw something in you maybe you know when you were talking about when he offered you the position yeah Jacques Vaughn comes along in Orlando and gives you the chance to break into the NBA right. what did that mean to you and what did Jacques teach you 
Uh, that was incredible because, again, it's, um, there was no real previous relationship with Jock. So he just had seen something. I had uh, been working with Tobias Harris for years. He, he, uh, he along with Kemba, were a part of my first pre-draft class that I had. And um, so Tobias had been playing pretty well for them at that point in time after being traded uh, from Milwaukee. There was also an assistant there, Brett Gunning, who's now in Houston, uh, who was uh, an assistant coach at Hofstra. So it just started piecing together. And a lot of the pre-draft guys that were coming in that we had worked with at the time were basically working out for them because they were in the draft mm -hmm. lottery every year. And so Jock kept asking, who are you guys working with? Well, we're out in Long Island with Jay Hernandez. And he heard the name. He knew me through Tobias and through Coach Gunning. And um, I think after a little bit, after two years of that, he said, all right, well, we need something here. We've got some really talented young guys. And uh, you know, I thought, I thought him doing that and taking a chance was, was really big. And uh, you know, I don't take that for granted. You know, being on the inside now, seeing how many people want to get in yeah. you know, just into those positions. I was very fortunate. I uh, learned a lot. Um, obviously, JB was there at the time. Wes Unseld, who lead assistant in Denver, was there at the time as well. And Brett, uh, it was just a tremendous staff. So first two weeks, I just really didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> I was around just basketball. Heads, yeah. yeah, I was around basketball my whole life, and I was like, I don't know. The terminology was different. Everything was different. Mm -hmm. And um, that was because they also because they were together for two years, so they had established their own routines and and, and ways of doing things, and they, they they termed them themselves. So I just asked for a glossary of terms. I got the glossary of terms. I started studying it like I was in school. And then finally, I said, I'm not going to have an answer. I'm going to ask an engaging question. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the first thing I do. And if I can do that and, and get us to think about other things, uh, I did my job. And I, at the time, I don't remember what I asked, but I remember that. <laughs> it must have been the right thing. Yeah, it, it, it got us talking about something. And, and Jack's like, I like that. So I, that, that's basically how I started and, and got myself going. Well, clearly that's worked out for yeah. you. You did mention that you worked with JB while you were in Orlando. How did that relationship begin from then that brought you here to Charlotte? Well, JB was already mentoring me, you know, as a guy that had been in the league for a while. And I was asking him a whole bunch of questions about the stuff that we use, sports code, and some of the things that we do behind the scenes with sorters and helping players out. Uh, he already had a track record, obviously, in San Antonio and being in New Orleans and stuff like that. So uh, he was already helping me out. And luckily, I was doing more than what my job was, you know, was telling me I was, I was supposed to be doing because I wanted to learn and grow. And when he became the interim head coach, all that stuff that I was already putting in helped me help him at that point in time, you know, for the last 30 games of the season. We were really a, a skeleton crew at that time. Um, they'd let go of assistant coaches, our head video coordinator. So uh, at, at that point in time, it was just an opportunity to show him, you know, that I had grown just in that short amount of time. And looking back, I still was way behind the eight ball, but <laughs> I really just tried to work, really at work everybody and do my best to, to give good personnel, good scouts. And uh, it was, you know, trial by fire, but it, it definitely helped me grow for the next year and, and, the, and the year after that when, when some of the other coaches were coming in. Fast forward to now here in Charlotte. You're getting a chance to work with two guys that you've helped develop in Kemba Walker and Jeremy Lamb. What has that been like and how can you describe both of their developments from start to now? It's been tremendous. Like I said, I got a chance to start with Tobias and now go to another team in the NBA and get with guys that I had extensive time with. Uh, you know, they, they spent a lot of time in Long Island, uh, especially Jeremy. Obviously, um, Kemba's from New York, but Jeremy being from out of state, was able to come in and spend three months in Long Island and, and come over for family dinners and, and things of that nature. Uh, so just to see them start off the way they did in different different facets, whether not winning games or not getting the playing time that they wanted, to now um, being integral parts of, of a franchise, it's really cool to see. And uh, just to be here, to have that comfort level, um, knowing where they are, are at in their careers, where I am, I, I feel like I can help them even more. Um, I've got some new tricks in the bag, so to speak, that um, you know I want to keep sharing with them, and um, and they teach me a lot. You know, I just see the way they work and some of the things that they've done with the previous staff that was here, who did a tremendous job with them, and uh, so it's just a continuous process of going back and forth and communicating and just trying to one up each other in terms of you know development. When you talk about your career, it's like you you continue to talk about these things where it's hard work is really paid off for you. You might not have known exactly what you were getting into when yeah. it happened, but you put in the extra work. Both those guys have put in the extra effort on the court. Yeah. How hard of workers are those two guys? Uh, tremendous. I mean, they, they just buy into whatever needs to be, um, you know, done. And 
uh, again, anytime you talk to them, it's, it's very quick for them to try to apply the things that we're working on. And mm -hmm. that's very hard to do. You know, it's one thing to acknowledge things, but then to apply it is completely different, mm -hmm. especially at this level when you're being watched by millions and, you know, you got 25,000 people, you know, critiquing everything that you do. And so uh, for them to have the confidence in, the, in their abilities and their work to go out there and do it is, is something that you don't see every day, especially at, at this level. All I know is Kevin never scored 60 before you got here. Kevin scored 60 <laughs> now, so we're going to attribute this to no, Jay. No, not Great me. work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on, on the flip side of that right now, Jeremy's playing probably his best basketball. Kemba's struggling a little bit after a great start to the season. When we say struggling, he's still averaging 26 yes. points. I mean, let's think about that. But considering the start he got off to, as his coach, what are you saying to him to try and keep his head up and get him back into that kind of form? It's not much to be said. It's just it's it, it continue to do what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when he was uh, when he had the 60 and everything was happening, uh, the great thing about Kemba, you guys know him, he stays even keeled. Mm -hmm. Uh, his attitude remains consistent, and I think that's the thing. Like the, he's been around long enough to know that there's going to be highs and lows, and so um, you know, without the, with, during the season, if you can just maintain that, mm -hmm. I think uh, you're in a good position, and that's what he is. He's, he does other things for us besides scoring. That uh, he's a threat at all times, which already makes other guys better on the court. You know, obviously his passing has, has been been a lot lot better. I think I feel like in terms of getting guys in positions, and um, you know, defensively he's been doing some nice things for us. So I think from that standpoint, it's not just we don't talk a lot it's just we come in we work and we keep doing what we've we've been doing um so we, obviously we we watch film and we break down some things that we see we can improve on and he's always looking for that but uh you know everything else will, will take care of itself through through the work you put in and that doesn't stop during the season for us you know it's an off-season thing but then during the season we maintain it yeah. For the team as a whole, when you're coming off of three losses, what's the message to the team in shoot-around or in general going into tonight's game? We just got to focus on ourselves. So, you know, you can see that uh, a lot of these games, it comes down to one or two things, um, you know, throughout the game, not just at the end, you know, last minute, but, uh, you know, things that you can do better in transition. Um, guys, you know, maybe not blocking out when they should be, you know, just really being great at basic. And for us, um, you know, with the team we have, we have such good good players overall, you know, guys that have great chemistry. Uh, if we just continue to do those little things over and over again, we're going to be able to get ourselves into a situation now when tonight, went on the road and then come back and have five, five at home again, which is, which is going to be great. All right, well, we'll let you go get ready for this game tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. All right, well, we'll close out by taking a look at the Charlotte Hornets original uniforms in our 30th anniversary series. For Matt Ruchinski, for Jay Hernandez, this is Aaron Pitsenberger for Hornets.com. I got a phone call at my studio and offices in New York. Uh, George Shin and I shared a banker from NCNB back in those days. And she called me, a wonderful lady, and she said, Alex, I have another client in Charlotte who has just gotten the franchise for the new NBA team in Charlotte, and he would like to talk to you about maybe discussing the uniforms and the team colors. And I said, bring it on. George asked me, uh, he said, Alec, can, can we afford you? <laughs> and I started thinking about it, and it was like, you know, what, what good is money in Connecticut, where I lived, if you can't buy Carolina barbecue? And, and so I, after some deliberation, uh, uh, went to George and said, OK, here's the deal. I'll design the uniforms for you uh, for five pounds of Carolina barbecue a month to be FedEx to me in Connecticut. I thought it was kind of neat. They brought in a well-known designer Alexander Julian, and suddenly teal was the color of the day, teal and purple. Holy Moses! He said, now, if possible, we'd like you to use the colors that our great architects have chosen for our new arena. There's uh, Carolina blue and white. That's easy. <laughs> I'm from Chapel Hill. Um, 
and there's uh, uh, teal. And I said, wait a minute, George, do you know that teal is my signature color? The color teal that is my signature is not the teal that the architects chose for the stadium. The, the teal that they chose is what I would call a bottle green. And, and so I said, Mr. Shin, I think that's okay, but it's a little close to the Celtics. And uh, I know it's a little risky, I know it's a little pushy, I know it's um, always a little scary to be doing something that's not out there. But um, my recommendation is, is that we use teal and purple for the uniforms. And uh, he agreed. I think that when you go out and get a nationally known designer to design your uniform and pick your colors, it's just the natural thing to do to have him come to town and with one of your players introduce the uniform. You know, where have you ever heard of this before that you have a, like a uniform reveal and a, a, an elaborate thing? And Alexander was great, you know, he did a great job. You know, it was a stage and a press conference and all these, you know, fashion icons were there and they're taking pictures. So I, I ate it up and did what I was supposed to do and acted like a model. I don't know if it worked, but uh, people said it was fun and we had a good time. And yes, we did start a trend, but it's one of many that the Hornets started. To see the uniforms were, were pretty unique. You know, the, uh, they, the jerseys had stripes, but the shorts didn't. One of the radical things was uh, not having the jersey and the shorts match. Um, and to me, that made it sportswear, where, you know, you don't, guys don't wear little outfits, you know, you, you have, you have a, pair, a pair of shorts or a pair of pants and you put a shirt with it and we even played around with doing it contrast color, but kept, kept it with the, the same original teal. Alex had some really defined ideas of, you know, of a look that could look appropriate and athletic and masculine, but also stylish and different. When we got the uniforms for the very first time, we really didn't test them out. So we go to play a preseason game in New Jersey and the shorts are flared out and the jerseys are too long. I mean, the, the shorts were out to here, the shirts were too big. Uh, everything had to be taken in. They just they didn't know how to do sizes and how they fit and whatever. So, you know, you gotta, I always think if you look good, you'll, you'll play good. You know, at least you'll think that way. And all I get is phone calls saying, hey, we need to get a, uh, a tailor to the practice site tomorrow. Without telling me, Kelly and the whole team, and you can ask Muggsy or Kelly or any of these guys, uh, went in to, to my tailor in Charlotte and had all of their shorts taken in before the first home game because they thought they were going to get laughed at. We really liked the colors of the uniform. It was the pleats. We, we thought, okay, you're getting a little too formal for basketball. and uh, We didn't realize, we didn't know you know what they would look like. We knew the shorts aren't, weren't long like they are today. We we're like, okay, we got short shorts. We're gonna have pleats. Are uh, we gonna get laughed at throughout the league? See, look here, man. I told we're supposed to have uniform, not Daisy Dukes, <laughs> cause they're a little riding up a little high here. And they were shorter shorts. We didn't have the long drawers. They were shorter shorts so they could show your legs, which I had some nice legs during that time. Looking back now, they were so sweet. They're so sweet with the purple and the teal. I didn't like the material. The color was fine, but I didn't particularly like the material. It was kind of stiff and, 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 and rough. The material, when it got wet, got very heavy. You know, it drooped and dragged. They were not comfortable to play in, but um, I, I like the color, I still do. Well, we had to get used to it, especially then the pinstripes came. You know, so we had to get used to, okay, well, this is a little different. Uh, but they actually look better on uh, than we thought. So, you know, we didn't have a choice. We, we were not warm, played hard, so uh, they grew on us, to say the least. I was like, wow, I, I remember getting a call and they, they, they said we had Alexander Julian designing our uniforms. And, uh, you know, me and Kelly had played together, you know, for three years up in Detroit. And, you know, he was coming in, he was modeling the uniforms around. And uh, it was definitely something different. So I said, you know, Charlotte's going to be a special place. And for whatever reason, te teal and purple at the time were very different from most people's color schemes and it caught on. It was a, a uniform that we really grew accustomed to very quickly. I mean, Alexander Julian did an excellent job with that. And, um, you know, we was one of the only team in the, in the league that was 
you know, sporting the, the pinstripes. And the pinstripes were really cool. I don't think anybody had ever done that with basketball before. I tell you, you know, when you think of pinstripes, you think of the Yankees, you know. You know, but it was something unique about those colors, the purple and teal. Some people looked at them as soft colors. Uh, some people looked at them as very stylish colors, you know, and I think our game kind of brought some excitement to the team when it made that color, you know, it made that color a fashion statement. It really did. And so you saw a lot of young people wearing the purple and teal. And the kids loved it. It was one of the biggest selling uniforms at that time. It's also very unique. And the pinstripes and the, the teal and the purple, uh, very unique. Um, it was difficult to find the, the, you know, get companies to make the shoes to go with the uniform. But, uh, you know, I like the purple and teal. Love them, love them, purple and teal. Everywhere we went in the country, whether it was LA, Phoenix, Portland, People love the color of our uniforms, the, the, the teal and purple, uh, and they couldn't get enough of it. I think that we were like up there, like num number one or two or three in sales um, for a long time. It seemed to really catch on. Everybody loved that purple and teal, and you know, I, it helped that you know we had great players to go out there, you know, and, and to promote that. And you know, when you when you have players like Larry Johnson and Alonzo, that guys that people. You know, you want to buy their jerseys and they think the colors are cool and for some reason it just caught on and, you know, people were wearing Hornets gear everywhere. <laughs> Those uniforms was, it was, if I can say it, it was badass, man. I mean, it's, 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 the colors just, it, it gave you a good feel. Uh, it was, it was a popular color, at, you know, uniform at the time and uh, to be able to get out there in that, you know, that teal and that white, and then, uh, in, you know, some cases just the all teal. I mean, it was, I can put these colors with anything and I can feel good about it, I can look good. And, you know, even to, even, even to this day, you know, I still have some of my old Charlotte Hornet stuff. If I pull it out, people want to want to take it from me because of the colors, you know? Yeah, and, you know, that that's that's another reason why I wanted to, to stay in Charlotte because of those uniforms, man, the prettiest uniforms in the league. <laughs> it's that whole, how do we make ourselves different? How do we make this not just an expansion team, but something different? And they wanted to take it to the next level, and the, the uniforms did that. But you never missed that the Charlotte Hornets were playing because they had this iconic design, coloration, and uh, suddenly teal was the it color, and that was because of the Charlotte Hornets.